The, the job of the writer is not to provide the answer, but to ask, ask the question precisely, right? Um, so that's what I really focus on. What am I, what am I trying to investigate? And how ruthlessly honest can I be about investigating it? We're very excited to have Kim McLaren here with us tonight the author of novels Jump at the Sun, Meeting of the Waters, and Taming It Down, as well as the memoir Divorce Dog, Motherhood, Men, and Midlife. You may also be familiar with her writing, which has appeared in the New York Times, Glamour Magazine, The Washington Post, Slate, and The Root, among many others. Uh, her work has been recognized by the Massachusetts Center for the Book, with a nomination for a Hurston Wright Legacy Award, and as a selection by the Black Caucus of the American Library Association as a 2007 fiction honor book. She is the Graduate Program Director for Popular Fiction and Publishing at Emerson College, and she regularly appears on WGBH's Basic Black. We live in wild times. There is no script for it, and each of us must consider what it means to be a person in the world. In her new collection, Womanish, Kim McLaren takes all this on, gender, race, age, culture, these emotionally honest essays dive into what it means to be a black woman in America in 2019. It has been named the February selection for Bookmarked, the Under the Radar Book Club at WGBH. Uh, writing in Forward Magazine, Letitia Montgomery Rogers says, McLaren's penetrating narrative voice is completely at home in itself, whether it's taking on the culturally related monoliths of beauty, blackness, white feminism, motherhood, mental illness, health, or class. Integrating the work of formidable black intellectuals, research data, interview excerpts, and memoir, McLaren casts systemic issues in experiential terms, anchoring them in a narrative of friends, family, and self. Womanish is the education the United States needs but doesn't deserve. Not only has McLaren done the homework, she's created an elegant cheat sheet in the form of 13 perfect essays. We are very pleased to have Kim here this night, so please join me in welcoming her to Harvard Bookstore. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. It is so exhilarating to see um, so many uh, faces that I know and love from so many parts of my life. One of the great things about releasing a book is that it brings all my worlds together, like Emerson world and uh, Milton world and uh, church world, scary. And, uh, <laughs> and um, it makes me realize how blessed I am. Truly. So thank you all for coming. I want to thank Harvard Bookstore for having me. Support your local independent bookseller. Woo! Yes! And um, most in, I want to thank my family and God. Church girl, I would say, I always got to start, thank by giving honor to God. Start by that. And um, I also want to thank the unicorn who's sitting right there. He hates it when I call him the unicorn. Um, when I first said, I'm going to start calling you the unicorn, he's like, he was a little nervous. He said, what does that mean exactly? And I said, you know, mythical creature doesn't, it, doesn't exist in real life. He's like, okay, that's okay. That's fine. <laughs> Just wanted to be sure. So thank you. Um, I'm going to read from a couple, I'm going to read, I'm debating whether to read a lot from one essay or a little bit from a couple of essays, and I decided to read a little bit from a couple of essays, because then you can get a taste of the book, and, you know, less is more, and leave you wanting more, and if you don't like one of them, you won't have to endure it too long, <laughs> um, and I'm going to start, um, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to start from like the hardest essay and go to the easiest because everyone, the, I've been getting a lot of feedback from friends and from strangers and online and people say, oh, I really loved your book. It made me so sad. And I was like, really? Because I'm not really sad. Um, so I'm sorry that it made you sad, but that's not the way I feel. So I, I'm going to try to read you some less sad parts tonight. So hopefully no one will leave here crying. I don't. Um, I don't feel sad when I write. I feel I feel released and exhilarated. And um, as I told Callie on our great conversation the other night, I have this really useful thing for a writer, which is am an amnesia. When I write, um, she said, Callie asked me, um, "These are very personal. How do you how do you deal with that? Are you scared?" And I was like, "I have a very very useful thing for a writer, which is this total amnesia when I sit down to write, that or this total lack of recall that actually somebody might read this. Like I really don't think about it." because I'm so focused on trying to pare away at what I'm trying to say, to get at the truth that I'm going to say. So it's like, I don't think that somebody's going to read this. That's a useful thing for a writer. It's not until it's public, published that I go, oh, shit. Excuse me. 
somebody's got to read this. And as I told Callie, you know, my mother's going to read this, more importantly. And uh, when I just visited her in California, she kept asking for the book. I, took, I went out to visit her, and she said, do you have a new book out? Can I have it? And I said, yeah, I have it. I have it. It was three days. I put her off for three days. And then as I was leaving for the airport, I said, here's the book. Bye. <laughs> so, all right. So I'm going to start with uh, the hardest um, essay in the book, which is Eshu, which is a book, uh, an essay about um, depression. And I even hesitate to say that because um, I'm writing an essay now about naming things and about how, on the one hand, it's important to name things, and at the same time, as soon as you name things, they, you flatten them. So this is a book, an essay about depression, but it's also not. All right. It's called Eshu Finds Work. In July, as Eshu is chasing me down, I stumble across a newspaper article about a group of men in London who like to dress and live as dogs. These men, these members of the pup community, spend their time dozing on the floor. It's okay to laugh. <laughs> these men, these members of the pup community, spend their time dozing on the floor and leaping around with squeaky toys. They roll in the dirt. They nuzzle their human handlers. The article makes it clear that these men seek only acceptance as they are, which I am certainly willing to grant. Still, I can't but help think of a phrase from my childhood, a phrase about which I am ambivalent, but which I cannot completely disavow. And the phrase is this. Now that is some white folks' mess. <laughs> white folks' mess was a phrase used often by the adults in my black Southern family, especially the woman a phrase by which a whole host of bewildering behaviors and events could otherwise be explained. Pet rocks and deviant sexual practices, camping, <laughs> paying $50 for a pair of ripped jeans, kissing your dog, sorry y'all, uh, happy days and Ronald Reagan and Barry Manilow, and mental illness. Mental illness, mental disorder of any possible stripe was definitely white folks' mess. White people had nervous breakdowns. Black folks just got tired of shit. White people had anxiety. Black folk had nerves. Black folks got the blues sometimes, but only white people got clinically depressed. White people listened to Prozac. Black folks listened to their mother, their pastor, and to God. I'm going to skip some. A few days after reading about the pup community, I opened a file on my computer and began writing up drafts of suicide notes. This is not so much the start of any coherent plan as it is a means of confronting head on the tricky spirit that has been loping around the past few weeks, sharpening its claws, readying its cruel and damaging pranks. It occurs to me that for a writer, a suicide note is no minor thing. One's last literary production, one's final words to the world. Talk about pressure. What do you say that makes sense that won't embarrass you in your biography? What do you say even if you know no one will ever write a biography of you? I, being me, decide to do a little research. Famous writers and their suicide notes. <laughs> I begin, of course, with Papa. July 2nd, 1961. Ernest Hemingway climbs from bed at his house in the Sawtooth Mountains early in the morning, walks to the storage room where his beloved firearms are kept, takes out a double-barrel shotgun, and shoots himself. I hate guns, but Hemingway kept a lot of them. Firearms are by far the most common method of suicide. 55% of people who take their own lives do so by firearm, according to the Centers for Disease Control. Nearly two-thirds of the gun-related deaths in the United States each year are suicides, meaning the majority of people who die by gun in America do so at their own hand. Gun suicides are especially prevalent among men. Hemingway, that man among men, did not leave a note. But in Death in the Afternoon, he wrote this. There is no lonelier man in death, except the suicide, than the man who has lived many years with a good wife and then outlived her. If two people love each other, there can be no happy end to it. Perhaps Hemingway killed himself because he feared a decline of his vaunted masculinity or the loss of his prodigious writing skills. Perhaps he feared losing Mary, who lay sleeping upstairs when he pulled the trigger and presumably heard the shot. Perhaps he was just tired and wanted to go out on his own terms. Nobody really knows, though plenty of people have speculated. That's what happens when you don't leave a suicide note. People can make up any shit they want. I'm 
I'm going to read one more section from, <laughs> from that. Near the bottom of the tumble, is that, can you handle it? Yeah, you, <laughs> near the bottom of the tumble, I began calling on people for help. This is almost always a mistake. One has to be very careful who one talks to in the midst of a depressive episode. Not everyone is your friend, not even your friends. People want to be helpful, but what they think of as help is less like tossing a rope to a drowning person and more like tossing an anvil. What could possibly be the matter? You're fine. It's always dark, it's before the dawn, God never closes a door, smile and the world smiles. Come on, you're a strong black woman. This kind of help stems partly from good intentions, but also from a pervasive societal belief that depression is really a kind of moral failure, a bad attitude, a shortage of will. Percentage of people who think depression is a personal weakness, according to the US Department of Health and Human Services, 54. Percentage of black people who think so, 65. In the United States of America, land of the eternally young and the eternally cheerful, complexity of feeling is suspect. Anyone disinclined toward the warm bath of relentless happiness risk being branded negative. Once when I was on a date, a man I had just met asked me if I believed I would find my soulmate. I refrained from saying that I didn't believe in soulmates or that research shows that people who do believe in soulmates tend to be less satisfied in their relationships. <laughs> and said only that, I certainly, that while I certainly hoped to find a partner someday, there was no guarantee I would. He looked at me as if I had pulled a puppy from my purse and drowned it in my water glass. <laughs> With an attitude like that, he said, I fear for your future. Exact words. All right, so I'm gonna leave that one and um, I'm going to read on, to move on to another essay, which <laughs> um, is called Becky and Me. This is about the relationships between white women and black women. For y'all who don't know what Becky refers to, um, it's a word that uh, black, black folks use for white women. Um, an older word is Miss Ann, or naming Miss Ann. Um, and so I'll read the beginning, which is just a page, and then I'll read just another section. And um, as Callie and I talked about on her show, this is about the struggle towards true sisterhood, if we're going to struggle towards true sisterhood, and what needs to be done by white women, if that's gonna happen. And I interviewed a lot of, so I interviewed a lot of black women friends for this, so it's not just my, it's um, reflection, it's about what are these relationships that we are tangling towards? Um, as an aside, I just wanna say, I also had a twin essay called um, Aisha and Me, which is about the relationships between black women, but I didn't get it done in time. But I just want y'all to know that that should have been in the collection too, <laughs> all right? Because that's a different subject. In the scene from Roots that I most remember, Missy Ann informs Kizzy that she is to become her property. Missy Ann, played by America's then sweetheart Sandy Duncan, is the teenage niece of Dr. William Reynolds, enslaver of the captured African named Kunta Kente, and his daughter Kizzy, played by the great Leslie Uggams. Missy Ann, the name itself is black shorthand for a white woman, a forerunner of Becky, and Kizzy have grown up together. Missy Ann has even secretly taught Kizzy to write and read. She is delighted at the prospect of becoming the legal owner of her friend. Kizzy, less so. Among other, things, <laughs> among other things, she doesn't want to leave her family. But she knows enough not to voice her displeasure. She faints and faints until Missy Ann demands an answer. Kizzy, says, says the white woman, pouting, don't you want to be my slave? Aren't you my friend? Years later, when I tried to make my daughter watch the original series in the vain hope that it would mean as much to her as it had to me, much of the writing seemed dated, the setting stagey, the acting overbroad. But that scene, in particular, still sliced. Even my daughter felt it. Oh my God, she said, can you believe that? But by then, I could. Don't you want to be my slave? Aren't you my friend? To which Kizzy, smart enough to know she has no alternative, responds, of course I's your friend, Missy Ann. And thus the lies begin. Let that sit with y'all. 
Oh, no. Actually, I'm going to read another little section of that. <laughs> it's about the Women's March. <laughs> then there was the Women's March. Uh, I'm going to skip some of the beginning um, about how most of my black women friends were like, meh, about the original Women's March. But the white women were all abuzz. Many of my white colleagues asked if I was going. A white woman I did not know and had never met approached me in the CVS, this is true, right downtown, approached me in the CVS to inquire if I was going. She, like the others, was super excited. For many of them, it was their first march. They'd been busy, I suppose, when we marched when Trayvon Martin was killed and when Michael Brown was killed and when Tamir Rice was killed and when their killers got off. But they were showing up now for what? For women. At a dinner party the night before the march, a white woman I did not know told me she had purchased a face mask and armed herself with jugs of milk. I blinked at her. <laughs> Why did you do that? I asked. <laughs> In case the police attack us, she said. When was the last time you saw police attack a group of white women? I asked. <laughs> she fumbled through a reply, but we both knew it was ridiculous. Had she really thought the possibility of danger existed, she would not have been leaving her house. They won't attack white women, I assured her. They'll probably hand out daisies. Bottles of water, said another black woman friend of mine. Swag, I added. <laughs> By the way, I was not wrong. <laughs> the night of the march, I met a lovely middle-aged white woman and her white husband from a white town in white central Massachusetts. I was at a white party, one of three colored folks in the room. She and her neighbor and their daughters had attended the sister march in downtown Boston, and she was still glowing from the experience. How exhilarating it was, how powerful and connected she felt. What fun. Did she want to talk about police brutality against black people, about systemic racism in the justice system, about segregations in our urban schools? I'm not very political, she said. I nodded. That must be nice. Um, <laughs> we're getting lighter, don't worry. Um, the next one is about death. Um, and <laughs> about me, um, it's called Visiting Mrs. D. And this is about um, the time a couple of years ago when I volunteered at a hospice um, because I, I always try to be doing something for one thing. And the, the truth is, and I don't want to sound either grandiose or crazy, but I wanted to confront the reality of death. I thought um, we spend so much time running from the reality of death in this society, right? We don't see it because we put people in hospitals and put them away and all that kind of stuff. And I thought I should not be 50 years old and not have confronted the reality of death. So I went to confront it. Um, so I vol volunteered in a hospice and I met this amazing woman named Mrs. D, um, who was from the north end of, Italian American from the north end of Boston. and. This is about her. So I'll read a couple pages of that. I'll start halfway through. Sometimes when I visit Mrs. D, she is depressed. I want to go home, she says. I know, I say. We have been trained to listen, to reflect, to console. What would you want to be doing if you were home? I'd do what I want. This is as close to a flash of temper as I have ever seen from Mrs. D. Here, here I have to do what they want, when they want me to do it. Another day when I visit, I am surprised to find her in bed instead of the wheelchair where she normally sits. Her feet are hurting. They stretch out strangely at the end of her bed, encased in a pair of the fuzzy socks she is dressed in by the staff each morning. Today's socks are blue and match her blouse. I got two good legs and there's nothing wrong with them except they don't work, she says, disgusted. I can't even go to the bathroom on my own. Another day, she is in bed because her shoulder has been hurting. I went to therapy, she tells me, twice. She told me I've been abusing my side by leaning to the left when I sit in the chair. I know what that means. That means no more therapy. She shrugs and looks away. Later, she says to me, you know, death is hard, but dying is harder. Other days, though, she is remarkably cheerful. Far more cheerful, I think, than anyone has a right to expect and certainly more cheerful than I know I would be. She has a wicked sense of humor. She asks about my hair, I have locks, and I compliment hers, a fluffy brown cl cloud around her head. 
I'm the only one in here with brown hair, she says, and mimics shaking a bottle of dye. <laughs> I'm going brown to my grave. <laughs> she advises me to start dyeing the tiny gray roots beginning to appear around my face, <laughs> saying bluntly that they make me look old. <laughs> when you are dying, and we are all dying, there's no time for bullshit. Some of who I am and what I do sticks with her from visit to visit, and some does not. She asks over and over again if I have children and what I do for a job. One time, I show her the copy of Invisible Man that I am carrying, having just taught it that morning to a bunch of undergraduates. She looks at me and says, so you get paid to sit around and read? <laughs> That's a pretty good job. <laughs> I do not argue. <laughs> The one thing about me that sticks with her always is that I am divorced. It came up the first time we met, and she brings it up often after that. One time she says, I remember something about you and a divorce. I'm divorced, yes. I smile to show her that I am fine. I don't like divorce, she says. I don't think anybody does, really. It happens, though. Yes. It might happen to me, she says. I laugh, thinking she is making a joke but she does not smile, and so I stop laughing. It might happen to you. We are trained to listen. My husband told me he's in love with the nurse. He wants to be with her. I am pretty sure that I have read in her chart that her husband has been dead for a decade. Pretty sure, but not positive. How do you feel about that, I ask her. She shrugs. Who am I to stand in the way of love? She says her husband is bringing the papers for her to sign. She asks me if there are a lot of papers to sign for a divorce. I tell her, no, not many. It's not so bad. The week before Christmas, we talk about her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren, 11 and 12, respectively. Too many to buy presents for, she says. She asks if my ex-husband will come for Christmas dinner. When I say no, because he has remarried, she says, oh, here I was siding with him, and you're the lonely one. This pierces me. As I am leaving each week, Mrs. D asks if I will come again. I tell her that I will. But at home, I receive a call from the hospice program. Mrs. D is being removed from the program, the coordinator tells me. She has exceeded the time limit. What does that mean, I ask? It's an insurance issue. You mean she hasn't died soon enough? It's an insurance issue, she says. Please do not go see her anymore. I tell the coordinator I cannot just stop visiting. She tells me that if I go without their approval, it will jeopardize their insurance or their license or some such nonsense. We go back and forth and back and forth for a while, but already I have decided to resign from the hospice. I will keep visiting Mrs. D on my own auspices. I go once more and again, and we have a lovely visit watching the Kardashians. I forgot to tell you, she used to love to watch the Kardashians. <laughs> she knew those people like they were her family. Then I get busy out in the world, with some petty nonsense and miss the three weeks straight of visiting Mrs. D. And when I return, she is gone. And <laughs> I will end on a happy note um, of the essay that begins, that opens the collection called All Right Cupid, which is about online dating. And um, the reason, the impetus for this was the, there is a, a kind of, um, I don't know what, a meme or an understanding or a pervasive belief that online dating does not work for black women, right? That, um, uh-huh, all right, uh, <laughs> right? That online dating doesn't work for black women, that we don't, whatever, that it's, it's against us and all that kind of stuff. And I wrote this essay to say it does work. It might not work in the, Maybe not in the way you think, and then maybe not, maybe it does, but that it does work. So um, it's pretty in depth. I'm just gonna read the end, or a couple pages from the end. When I first took the plunge into online dating, the waters were indeed murky. Some men looked at my profile and declined to message me or did not respond when I worked up the nerve to message them. Some men made clear in their profiles that they did not find black women attractive. Other men, this is black and white men, by the way, other men straight out told me I was not for them. In isolation, these slings and arrows are wounding, but in quantity, they don't such, so much thicken the skin as make porous the ego, allowing passage straight through. 
Men rejected me for being too tall, too black, too smart, too educated, too serious, too old, too laden with children, too far from their home. So many men rejected me, and so many more men rejected some projection of me that I did not even recognize, that taking it personally became impossible. It was either embrace the profound truth that rejection is not personal, neither at bottom is love, but that's another essay, that regardless of what another person says or does, it is not about you, or stop getting out of bed. I kept getting out of bed. Many men passed me over, but many, many more, and I mean hundreds of them, perhaps even a thousand over the years I lost count, pursued me. Tall men and short men, fit, not so fit, much older and much younger, smart men, not so bright, <laughs> teachers, lawyers, bankers, telephone linemen, construction workers, snowplow drivers, website designers, and other vaguely techie guys, a movie producer, an airline pilot, a bricklayer, and at least one plastic surgeon, he was creepy. <laughs> Black men and white men and Latino men and even Asian men, if you, count, if you count Papua New Guinea and the Philippines, both of where I seem for some unknown reason to be especially popular. <laughs> the sheer volume and yes, variety of offers far beyond what any one woman could receive in one lifetime in the non-digital world obliterated any hovering doubt about my desirability. If white women and Asian women receive magnitudes more attention online than I received, God bless them. <laughs> Thus, the specter of undesirability, which is really the ghost of unworthiness, was finally laid to rest. For the first time in my life, the data worked for me. I will stop there. <laughs> well, you got to read the end of that essay where I say, you know, it didn't work in the way you think it works, that, you know, um, blah, blah, blah. I, I found, I went looking for a man and I found myself. And, also, I found a man icing on the cake. So, uh, um, so yeah. Okay, keep it. Um, I um, so I read this like in a day, um, and I really love the endings of every essay. Um, and so maybe this is kind of a fairly obvious question, but I guess I'm wondering. They always seem to end in a way that it's not. It doesn't feel like a kind of cheap like. And then the lesson is X kind of thing. Um, but it feels like, I guess I'm just wondering the extent to which you already know kind of where it's going. I mean, obviously you're writing about things that you've experienced in the past, but that doesn't mean that you're going to process it the same way that you did in real life as you are on the page. And so I'm wondering kind of how you get to that point where the end, it's not, it, is, it doesn't feel, it feels like somewhere completely different, but it doesn't feel unrelated to where you started. And um, I'm just wondering how you do that, basically. <laughs> I don't know. Um, that's a really good question. You know, I, uh, when I write an essay, I set out to investigate some issue, and I don't know what the answer to it is, and that's not really the point. It's about, you know, the, the old saying, I don't know who said it, but the Chekhov or somebody, that the, the, the job of the writer is not to provide the answer, but to ans ask the question precisely, right? Um, so that's what I really focus on. What am I what am I trying to investigate? And how ruthlessly honest can I be about investigating it? Um, and um, so I, 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 I'm not sure, I, I, I hear your question and I'm not really sure I can answer it other than to say, once I've investigated those two questions, it starts to come together. And there's a lot of revision, obviously, and a lot of, you know, examination and yeah they're not all happy endings but they are all um, true truthful endings and so I that's a good question and I don't I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to answer it any more coherently than than that that I just stay with it until I know what it is and that's hard right to just stay in it and stay with it until I know yes that's that's what I have to say about that subject and then I'm and then I'm done with it, right? Which is why when people say, oh, it made me cry, I'm like, I don't even remember it, because like, I'm, <laughs> I wrote that a lot a year ago, why are you crying about, right? Like, I'm over it, so. So, um, it sounds like it's therapeutic for you. Like, it's a process of reflection, and you can you kind of get to another place around those topics, or is it more like you've been mulling it over, and then you're just kind of put it in work? Yeah, you know, it's tricky, because I, I say, it, 
it can be therapeutic, but writing is not therapy, right? It's art. So, I mean, I'm definitely doing something deliberate, right? And that's the other thing, right? Like, I'm, I'm, by the time I'm writing something, I am, I am, it, it's still, it's still narrative. I'm still crafting something. So it's not, it is me and it's not really me, right? It's the truth, but it's not the whole truth. Or it's not all the truth, and the truth is constantly changing. So it is not therapy. Therapy is you write in your journal. This is, this is art. Um, but can it be therapeutic? It, um, yeah, absolutely. You know, the essay on depression, I wrote to make, to get down everything that I knew about depression. And then when I was done with it, I was done with it. Um, and it wasn't the therapy for the depression, but it was about, here's the thing that I'm experiencing, how can I articulate as precisely as possible what it is? Um, because people who haven't experienced depression, I'm, I'm, I'm adapting um, my last collection of essays into a, into a play, and I, in my writing group just the other day, I was, we came up with, I mean, I was like, people who think depression is, is stumbling into darkness, but in my experience, that's actually not what it is. The problem is just the opposite. It's seeing things too clearly. It's actually, sh it's like the spotlight on the life is too bright. All oh, y'all walking around in darkness, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's about dimming the light because it's painful to see things too clearly. So, um, so it is not, it is therapeutic, but it is not therapy. Is it, is it though therapeutic to name yes. your depression? Yes. And so why did you choose the name that you did? And has that personalized it or made it something that you can look at when you need to and put away like a, a distant friend or something that you know? Yeah, you know, the truth is that I, I, I named it in the writing, not in the experience of it. So that's where, again, it's art, right? So I named it in the writing, like how can I how can I, that's where the writer comes in. How can I create a narrative that will make sense to the reader about this experience? And so the issue, the trickster god, right, of the Yoruba people, and that made sense to me, right? Like it's, it, it, because it is, it, is, it is obviously a danger and a threat, but also um, not a monster, right? It is part of who you are, a mediator between you and the higher power, a different self. Um, so it really made sense to me. So the naming honestly didn't help me deal with the depression. That was um, antidepressants and you know menopause. Let's be honest, right? Uh, you know, right? That's the truth. Um, but the naming was necessary for the creation of the essay in order to um, personify it so that people could get what I'm talking about. And that's what I mean by it's not, it's not therapy, it's art. I'm, I'm working hard up here, y'all, right, you know? But yeah, but so that, that was, that's how that came out. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. How do you decide what to write about? It just whatever gets in my head and won't, um, won't, won't go away. Yeah, you know, it really is. It's about what am I, what am I, my, 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 Oh, I forgot to put it on. I had it on earlier. My James Baldwin pen. It's on my other sweater that I that I took off. Cat Callie gave me a James Baldwin pen. James Baldwin is my, you know, spiritual uh, hero um, and my writer hero. And he said the writer's job is to, you know, make light the dark to to make the world a more human dwelling purse, place in part by telling the truth. Right. The, the artist's job is to tell the truth about what it means to be human, about the society that you live in. And so I say, what have I not seen the truth about? What do I have some, what do I believe I've figured out some truth about something? And how can I say that? Um, that's really it, it just, it, it just varies. Um, you know, like I said, right now I'm writing an essay about naming things, about the importance of naming things and also the danger of naming things. Where did that come from? I don't know, I mean, it just came from both, uh, you know, Twitter, where people are like, oh, that's, you know, respectability politics, or, you know, we can, we name things and then we think we've understood them. And then, but then what does that do to them? So that's what I'm writing about. And I'm just trying to figure it out. You said that the essay about uh, black women friends is not in the book, but can you, since you've written it, can you uh, elaborate on some of the themes and, 
what the contrast might have been with Ms. Becky? Well, I'm still working on it, and it's it, it's just again, it's about investigating my journey to. I grew up, you know, where how I grew up um, in a black community, and then went. Long story. Uh, was you know shipped off to a boarding school, white boarding school, when I was 15, and and from there on out, lived in a majority white world, right? And about my journey to coming back to understand how I needed black women friends, right? Like I don't. I can't not exist without black women in my life. Um, and why that is and what that means and how, and I've traveled, I've moved so many places and how when I go to a new city, I have to seek out that connection and why that's important. And so that's, that's what that's, that's about. Have you written about your faith? I have. I actually wrote in my last essay about my faith and divorce dog. Yeah, I did. And that's, complicated too, right? <laughs> it's complicated. So yes, I did actually write about that. I just, well, um, I just like to say thank you. Because um, Sunday I was coming from work and I was just put the radio on. It's like a probably five minutes from work to home. And I would listen to the program when you interview and you read about the um, soulmate and the depression. It's like a it was fantastic, you know, I feel the connection, and it's like a, the voice. For so many times that we have it on us, they, but we don't know how to express it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.